Good morning. Welcome to ILT Chapel on November 19th, 2012. I'm Pastor Sarah Sorensen. I uh, live in Britain, South Dakota. I serve Salem Emanuel Lutheran Church in Long Lake, South Dakota. Let us begin. And we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord God, you have promised where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. We gather in your name, though we are not joined by proximity, nor by familiarity, nor by great size, but only because we have gathered in your name and seek your grace. Be with us now. Speak to us through your holy word. Give us your Holy Spirit to read, mark, hear, and inwardly digest it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our gospel lesson for today is from yesterday, um, the 25th Sunday of Pentecost, after Pentecost, uh, Mark 13, verses 1 through 8. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to tell you, this lesson gives me the hives or a nervous twitch or, or something. I can't hear it without flashing back to my seminary days when I was taking a course on the Gospel of Mark, and the professor divided us into small groups to exegete Mark and texts. I hate group work. If you're a conscientious student, you usually get ripped off while the slackers benefit. My experience in that class did not disappoint me, but gave me a new reason to hate group work. Wouldn't you know it, I was assigned to the group that got chapter 13 of Mark for its material. And right away, as we met in our small groups, and I do mean right away, a member of the group announced most adamantly that she was not going to, would not, could not take Mark, the 13th chapter, with talk of the temple crumbling to pieces and the sun and the moon going dark and the stars falling from the sky. She was not going to, she would not, she could not take this portion of Mark literally. Silly me. I did not yet understand the brave new church of which I was then a part. All I said, and I do mean all that I said was, but what if that is what's going to happen? She went ballistic. She reiterated that she was not going to, could not, would not take this portion of scriptural, scripture literally and she went off in a huff to rat and tattle to the professor. I suppose that I was some kind of raving fundy or something. So much for open minds. I got called into the professor's office to smooth things out in our small group. And all I had done was ask, what if? I didn't exert an opinion one way or the other. <laughs> and here's where the hives and the twitches come in. I got a B in the class. And to this day, I get a little cranky. Okay, I'll be honest, I get a little bitter all over again when this 13th chapter of Mark comes rolling around in the lectionary. What if those are two little but very big words? Often they are words of worry. For instance, a few weeks ago in my part of the world in Northeast South Dakota where I live, a couple of guys shot a wild boar. We just don't have those in our part of the world. Not even the game warden had ever seen such a thing in this area. No one knew we had wild boars. I heard of it, 
And my first thought was, you mean now I've got to worry about wild boars too? That wasn't even on my list of worries. Now I had to add a new one. What if? What if our dog gets away and a wild boar attacks him? What if a wild boar comes out of nowhere and starts attacking children out playing in the yard? What if I'm out in our yard and one is out there running around having wandered into town and it attacks me? What if? What if? What if? It's a question we cannot avoid, even if we want to. Even if we want to put away some what ifs, like my small group partner in Mark, there is a flood of other what ifs to take its place. Shel Silverstein, the beloved poet of the elementary school set, has written a poem entitled What If? And while it's put in terms of a kid's experience, I think we can all relate as our own what ifs come to mind. Last night while I was late, while I lay thinking here, some what ifs crawled inside my ear and pranced and partied all night long and sang their same old what if song. What if I'm dumb in school? What if they've closed the swimming pool? What if there's poison in my cup? What if I start to cry? What if I get sick and die? What if I flunk that test? What if green hair grows on my chest? What if nobody likes me? What if a bolt of lightning strikes me? What if I don't grow taller? What if my head starts getting smaller? What if the fish won't bite? What if the wind tears up my kite? What if they start a war? What if my parents get divorced? What if the bus is late? What if my teeth don't grow in straight? What if I tear my pants? What if I never learn to dance? Everything seems swell and then the nighttime what ifs strike again. Feel free to insert your own adult-sized what-ifs here. We just can't get away from them. But wait, there's more. The words of Jesus here beg the same question. What if these scary signs come to be? What if we are seeing some of them right now? What if there is persecution in our future? What if there is suffering ahead for us? What if everything we know in this life and world ends in a cataclysmic battle? What if all the good I've done and all the good you've done isn't enough to get us out from under a horrible end to all things? What if all my sins fall on me like the great stones of the temple and I am crushed, completely crushed beneath them? What if I am one of those who is led astray? What if the sun and moon go dark and the stars fall from the sky? What if the wailing wall comes tumbling down every last stone, not one stone left upon another? What if Jesus really does return and he's not a bit happy? What will become of me? What will become of you? There are only two ways that I can see to get around the question, what if? The first is to do what my small group partner back in that Mark course did. And that was essentially to stick her fingers in her ears and go, blah, 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 I can't hear you. I have to confess, I've been guilty of the very same thing with other passages of scripture. I have no desire to hear many of the things Jesus says. For instance, I don't want to take him literally when he says, love your enemies, pray for them. Well, that's one way of dealing with the what ifs. The second way is to acknowledge the what ifs. God's very word itself raises, but to also listen to the even so's. Even so, a two word answer to that two word question, what if? Even so. In the first chapter of Revelation, verse 7 in the RSV translation, it reads, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, let it be so. What if things get really ugly before and during Christ's return? Even so, come quickly, Lord. What if there are strange signs in the heavens? Even so, come quickly, Lord. What if my sins crush me and I have no ground to stand on when Jesus comes with the clouds and I see him for myself and I wail? Even so, come quickly, Lord. What if I got a B in the Gospel of Mark class I took in seminary? Even so, come quickly, Lord. Even so, Christ will come. And in that day, prophecies will yield 
to promises fulfilled. For in the 13th chapter of Mark, tucked in with all the turmoil and trouble our Lord prophesies to come, are also his promises, amazing promises such as these. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And also this promise is to be found there. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. And also this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus, who gave himself for you. Jesus, who is coming for you. Jesus, whose angels will gather you. Jesus, who will save you. Jesus, who binds his prophecies with promise. No one else makes prophecies and gives promises. Not the Mayans and their calendar. Not Nostradamus and his predictions not TV preacher X or radio preacher Y, not the evening news, not the morning news. What if weird, strange, and frightening things really do happen related to Christ's return? Even so, you can look for his coming. Even so, you can pray for him to come even more quickly. Even so, you will live. Even so. Those two words of promise, not of worry, are found in the book of Revelation, as I mentioned. They are also found in a beloved choir anthem composed by Paul Montz with the words uh, composed or put together by his wife. Paul Montz, you may know, is um, a late Lutheran composer and organist, much beloved in the Lutheran church. The piece I'm referring to is entitled, "In So Lord Jesus Quickly Come. If you don't know the piece, if you've never heard it, you really should look it up and listen to it. It puts the full in beautiful. According to Mons, the piece was written in 1953 when his and his wife Ruth's three-year-old son, John, was in the hospital, critically ill. His parents were not given much hope of his recovery. Ruth Mons took words from the book of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, Revelation, with all its strange images and conflict and talk of tribulation and end times, she took words from that and she knit them together and gave them to her husband, Paul Montz, and told him to do something with them, with them. And so he did. The last words of the piece are these, In so, Lord Jesus, quickly come, and night shall be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun, for Christ will be their all. What if our son dies? E'en so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. What if the world ends while I'm still in it? Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. What if the sun and the moon fail and the stars fall? Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. What if you and I face persecution for our faith? Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. What if your seminary prof assigns small group work? Just because you ILT students do your work online, don't think it can't happen to you. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. You can dare to ask the what ifs because Christ has given you the answer. Even so, even so, he is coming for you, in spite of your sins, in spite of the biggest, best good deeds that, like the great stones of the temple, are hard to imagine anyone destroying, he will come. You needn't plug your ears and walk away when Jesus speaks, for he, and he alone, has given you the promise that will see you through whatever comes, a promise so great and true and sure that you can say, with all confidence, with all faith, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. And should the greater and the lesser lights of his creating go dark, even then, you can say, even so, he will come. He will come, dear friends. He will. He will come, and he will save you. 
After all, there's a reason you call him Savior. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you know our fears and worries, our troubles and our sins. You know the troubles of this world. You know how this old world will end. Even so, we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Come soon and be our all in all. Now and even when the bright lights of this world go dark. We pray especially today, Lord, for those who are persecuted for bearing your name. In particular, we think of your people in Nigeria, Iran, and Nepal. Even so, come Lord Jesus, come to them and give them even more persecutable faith. Even so, Lord Jesus, come and bring them through the time of trial. Strengthen us as well in faith for our time of trial, that we may stand firm to the end and inherit the crown of life. We ask it for the sake of your name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you all peace in believing. Amen.